What's the worst place you've ever visited? Story 1. The Salton Sea made me sad. There was so much hope around this place. Now if you visit, it's a very poor town. The sand sucks your shoes off and smells awful, and the stench of dead fish permeates the air. Now their only bar presents as a David Lynch nightmare if you go. Actually, I took a boat out there some 40 plus years ago. It wasn't much better then. The stench, dead palm trees half rotted up the trunks, stuck in the middle of that disgusting, oily looking water. My sister-in-law fell into the nasty water by accident, was wearing a lot of silver jewelry. It was the style. Not in the muck for more than five minutes tops. All her jewelry turned coal black. Didn't stay long after. Why we even went is a mystery to this day. Must have been high on something. The only upside of the drought is maybe now the human-made accidental cesspool of water that we call the Salton Sea will finally dry up. You can get mad, but there's no denying that the sea has been an environmental disaster for almost 50 years that has killed many migrating birds. Story 2. Ever been into an office building where maintenance quit and the real estate company hasn't hired replacements in six months? Every broad office floor of cubicles looks like it's in a zombie movie. Half of the fluorescent tube lights are dead or flickering from a bad ballast. In some places the air is a bit too cold and dry, while in others it's too hot and humid. Enough to make you think there might be mold growing on the walls. It's like a massive fat bloated man was breathing his stinking breath on your neck. Oh, and the bathrooms. Oh, the bathrooms. I'm not even going to describe that. I'd rather not revisit the memory. The break room sinks weren't bad enough, but then people are more likely to take care of things they actually have to use. It's not as fire and forget as a men's room, except for the one break room where I felt someone mixed up the two types of rooms and figured a drain is a drain. A corporation in the final stages of decline is a sad creature. When I was a teenager, my dad was the head of a maintenance department for a business that owned a skyscraper in our city. He and two other maintenance men took care of light bulbs, decorating for holidays, shoveling snow, and salting sidewalks. The biggest thing they did all day though was adjust the air conditioning and heat for the 300 to 400 middle-aged female employees, most of whom were going through the change. Those ladies knew what a pain it was and would do things like buy the guys lunch a couple of times a week and bake them cookies or make them fudge. The coolest was that the company gave my dad and his maintenance men first dibs on concerts, musicals, Disney on Ice, and other kid shows and sports tickets that they didn't use for clients. Saw a lot of concerts and hockey games as a teen for free thanks to my dad's job. I worked security at a site like this. It was nearly 20 years ago and it was a former military contractor site with hangars that the city was renting out to people, including film studios that needed large places to shoot indoors. In my case, I was working my last two weeks when they started building sets for the Tom Hanks movie The Terminal. I got to see a huge facade of an airplane they used for some of the shots. Anyway, what most people don't realize is that a lot of those big hangars have additional enclosed spaces on each side of them, like really long narrow rooms or like really wide hallways, relatively speaking. Inside these were three floors of offices that sat on either side of each hangar. They had no windows, so imagine this. You come out of the stairwell, turn to your right, and it's completely dark except for a tiny pinpoint of light coming from an illuminated exit sign about 300 yards away. That's it. A 300 yard long pitch black hallway except the hallway occasionally opens up into rooms with cubicles in them before narrowing again. There were rats skittering around in the ventilation ducts and the reason I had to patrol was that homeless people would sometimes sneak into these places to sleep. Not all of them were dark of course, for example in one of the hangars the first two floors were partially lit by motion activated fluorescent lights that would kick on when you turn the corner. But none of the lighting was perfect, so you were still facing down 300 yards of darkness with only intermittent patches of flickering dim light here or there. Despite the spook factor, or maybe because of it, I do miss working there though. This was back in the early 2000s, so the pay was absolute crap. I'd do that job again if they pay me 20 plus dollars an hour. The job was about 80% patrolling and 20% sitting on your ass watching cameras. I was in great shape at the time because of all the walking, but holy hell it made the shift fly by. I'm gonna offer the opposite experience. I used to work at a big, sprawling office park in Atlanta where companies would lease a full floor for their operations. This was around the time of the 2007 financial collapse and one of the floors in my building was in the middle of a build-out while the company folded. 
I found out about it when a contractor stepped into the elevator and I was able to see the state of things. Well, I've always hated going to office bathrooms and have had trouble fully relaxing to do my business. So later that day, I decided to pop in and look at the space. Basically, everything had been stripped out of the office. I assume so that the now defunct company could build it out to fit their brand slash specifications. That is, everything but the bathrooms. They were pristine. There were construction supplies piled up outside the door, but I swear to God, it was like nobody had ever gone to the bathroom yet. There was a full 24-pack or whatever of toilet paper sitting on the sinks, and every fixture was sparkling new. I spent the next few months pooping in the absolute lap of luxury, told no one, and shed a tear the day our company was bought out and sent a different office space. So to all of you folks who don't believe in miracles, there is reason to have hope in this world. Story 3 Barstow, California. Imagine if an entire town was one big sketchy-ass truck stop. I owned a pistachio farm 25 miles northeast of Barstow and it wasn't that bad. The real crap hole is the group of crap cities to the south. Victorville, Apple Valley, Hesperia. I could walk around Barstow, and I did because of Pokemon Go, and not feel like, oh god, in Victorville, I wouldn't even want to get out of my car. Stabby hobos abound. Barstow has a train museum, a drive-in movie theater, the Mojave Desert Museum, and the fairly fun Treasure House Antique Mall. Gateway to Rainbow Ridge is a really pretty place, home to tons of amazing fossils of camels, big-toothed cats, and other exotic mammals. Plus, it's a great place for rock and mineral collecting, as seen in the field guide, Rockhound Barstow. I made it there hitchhiking, but fortunately got a ride from a lady on Craigslist. Her sister had ostriches in Arizona, and I helped with a yard sale, on my way to Saguaro Man 17. Was stuck in Bakersfield for 11 days prior, which is where I was going to mention. Jacksonville to LA, then I drove up 101 and sold my car in Portland. Walked back and took 99 to see something different. Dumbest stuff ever. Saw two dead dogs on sidewalks, one bloated and obviously been there a while. The majority of people on the streets are mentally ill. I read on the Amtrak scooting towards Bakersfield that they had recently had the largest kill ratio regarding cops to civilians. Meth was rampant. As it is, not the best combo. The tenderloin in San Fran is also mind-blowing for what it is. I'm not American, went to Bakersfield once upon a time many moons ago, and was absolutely floored at how one side of town is a complete and absolute steaming in the literal sense crap hole, and then there are all these green manicured gated communities. Also, everyone having Mexican maids and crap was an eye-opener to me until I ended up in Southeast Asia where maids are just a normal part of life. Previous Bakersfieldian here, Bakersfield is basically segregated, which is why one half is nice and the other is not. I was in the poor half and my high school was 96% Latinx. Meanwhile, the nice schools on the other side of town where kids actually end up getting into MIT and nice colleges are mostly white kids. The city is somehow more than 50% white, but I never had any clue because they somehow managed to redline all the Latinx people in one half of the town. Craziness. And don't even get me started on Oildale. Story 4. Zinc, Arkansas. It felt like I stumbled into the movie set for House of Wax, Children of the Corn, and Deliverance all in one place. They had a hair salon slash mechanic slash courthouse slash jail all in one building. The judge's wife was the hairstylist, the judge was also the mechanic, and the sheriff was his son. I lived in a tiny town, population 790, in rural New Hampshire where the post office, a hair salon, a mechanic, and some apartments were all in the same crappy old house. The town library and town clerk were in another, less crappy but still old house down the road, but there were many books they wouldn't carry because the town library also served as the school library, which wasn't connected to it but was across the street and down the road a little bit. I felt so alone in that town, but the place you described sounds so much worse. You're gonna mention Arkansas and not take the opportunity to crap on Pine Bluff, a place that smells so bad that it's literally mentioned in the Wikipedia article, a place that's the absolute model of 2000s urban decay with a mall whose only open stores are two Tex-Mex joints in the food court, a place where hopes and dreams go to die, home to Jefferson Regional Medical Center, also known as where grandma goes to die, does a place so ineptly run that its idea of economic 
revitalization consists of opening a medical weed farm and a casino? Where are the only people that live there anymore are the ones that can't afford to leave? Pine Bluff is to Arkansas what Mississippi is to the United States. Even Deliverance Land feels better knowing that Pine Bluff exists. Sounds like my dad's creepy as hell hometown in Tennessee. The town had 120 people and a 1 8 mile long downtown, half of which was boarded up and empty. The jail was located on the second floor of the hardware store owned by the sheriff, next door to the city hall where his wife slash cousin, the mayor, and his cousin slash brother-in-law, the magistrate, worked. Across the street from the hardware store was the barber, where the magistrate also cut hair and gave shaves, and the video rental store owned by the sheriff's son and sometimes deputy. The unofficial police dispatcher was also the clerk at the liquor store, because they were the only place in town with a direct dial number. Everyone else was on a party line or had a CB radio. The people were nice though, and it was a functioning town despite the look. They had a doctor, a great uncle of mine, a dentist, semi-retired and married to one of my cousins, and a fire department, volunteer. Story 5. Dukem Oman. Two hotels, a pizza hut, and a DFC, Dukem Fried Chicken. Also can't forget the hundreds of miles of new roads that led to more sand and dirt. It was built like the first five minutes of a SimCity 2000 game. Back in the day, Dukem had the only decent internet connection within a 500 kilometer radius, so at least had that going for it. Also an hour's drive from Kalef and Rasmadraka, some of the most gorgeous stretches of coast in the country. But yeah, the whole concept of Dukem is as if an urban planner jotted down some notes on a napkin whilst high on crystal meth. Oman was a surreal place, some very fascinating nature and cultural spots, but their tribes were originally sea merchants because the majority of the land itself was just rock desert. Lovely people, but it's as if their culture was only passed down orally and didn't exist on land. With their excellent oil wealth and small population, they are going through a massive housing expansion where everything new, including mosques made from concrete, is designed identically to a game's copy-paste. Oman doesn't have excellent oil wealth. I mean, they still have enough for their small citizen population to have a good standard of living. It's a welfare state, but the wealth per citizen ratio is nowhere near to the smaller Gulf countries. Kuwait, UAE, and Qatar are absolutely flush with oil cash with a tiny pampered citizen pop to spend it on. Most of their residents are expats. Story 6. I was helping friends move across the country and I called my husband one night when we stopped. He said, where have you gotten to? And I said, I don't know, but it's the ugliest place I've ever seen in my life. And he said, oh, you've gotten to Midland Odessa. And he was correct. I have seen a lot of the world and Midland Odessa, Texas is by far the most terrible place I've ever looked at. I used to visit schools and give science presentations. Based in the Midwest, I took the Western tour one year, which landed me in Midland, Texas. I took a drink from the school drinking fountain and spat it out. One of the teachers, who knew I was from the Great Lakes area, laughed and said, was it the salt or the petrochemicals that got you? I was posted outside of there for a few months. I loved it when it rained and everything would flood and have oil floats. Really interesting that this place is part of the USA. Some of the smaller towns down south towards Mexico are even worse. Story time. There was this pizza hut with kind of sultry waitresses, and always a bunch of tough biker types hanging out at it. The bullet holes in the wall were concerning. It turns out the Pizza Hut was a place you could buy a hooker. The joke is to ask for a pepperoni pussy and they'll send a hooker with a pizza to your room. I assume it's polite to share your pizza. I live in Midland, even though I don't like it here. It is the nicest of the two cities. The south side, and to a lesser extent the east side, are sketchy. The northwestern quarter, however, has a suburban feel. The northernmost side is where the rich-ass neighborhoods, the oil executives and doctors call home, and the country club they hang out at can be found. Odessa Odessa, on the other hand, with the exception of a relatively small upscale area on the east side, is a crap hole. I won't go to that dump of a town unless I have to. The flat desert landscape in which Midland slash Odessa is situated is ugly as hell though. Spent a night in a cinder block motel in Fort Stockton, Texas. The swimming pool was empty of water but filled with construction debris, rebar, demolished concrete, and ceiling tiles. Stopped in a convenience store at dusk and started hearing small pings coming from outside. Side. One of the clerks came in calmly saying he's still out there. Some guy had been taking pot shots at a distance at the store, apparently not aiming at anyone in particular, just shooting at the back of the building. Was happy to leave alive the next morning. Got weird vibes every time I've been through West Texas. 
I used to work for a major US oil company as an IT guy. My office was in New Orleans, but I'd get sent to the refineries and offices mostly along the Gulf Coast as needed. Well, when my counterpart at the office in Midland went on vacation, I got stuck there for a week at a time. Whenever I'm stuck somewhere for a bit, I try to find out what there is to do and or see. Out there? Absolutely nothing. It's like desolation had a child with misery and out came Midland. Story 7. Gary, Indiana. Apologies to those who live there, but it's kind of like the armpit of America. It reeks of a town that was once a cool place to be, but has just been left to the wayside. Always wondered about Gary. I lived in Michigan for a long time for an internship and took a passenger train to Chicago for fun sometimes. I believe it's called Shoreline or something like that. It passed right by Gary with the topiary spelling out the town's name. The town itself looks depressing. Gary is the epitome of a Rust Belt city not making any comebacks. The worst ghettos are in the Midwest because they're entire regions. Northeast Ohio is a scary place, and I'm from Lower East Side New York City. Certain parts of Western Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh are atrocious. Chicago suburbs are some of the worst ghettos around, and all of these are former steel mill towns. Very sad for America. My answer is also Gary, Indiana. The few times I've been there have been awful. I used to work at a crappy car dealership. I repossessed a decent Impala from this kid who had the car for three months and never made a payment. While the kid was having none of it, he came to our dealership, broke in, stole the car, and took it up to Gary to hide it, about two hours away. Well, all of our cars have GPS until the clients pay them off. My boss makes me go up with him to repo it. I hop in the car to take it back, but the kid's brother, and what I assume are the brother's friends, came out and aimed their guns at me. He's screaming at me about stealing his brother's car, and I try explaining that he stole it from us. He didn't care. I secretly call the police, tell them where I am, and that I'm being held at gunpoint. Frickin' two hours later, a single squad car shows up. He nonchalantly tells the brother to put away his gun and then gets mad at me. The cop yelled at me, Don't you know you can't roll up in here and steal a guy's car? After I explained the situation. Mind you, I had the title and all documentation necessary to show the car was ours, and we had 100% right to repossess the car the kid never made a single payment on. Story 8 the solids removal room of a wastewater treatment plant. I used to work in a lab that dealt with different kinds of waste streams and solids removal. Municipal waste was one of the better, if not the best, types of waste that came through the lab. The other types of waste like dairy, duck, and landfill runoff are 10 times worse. I spent an entire summer sampling cluster septic systems for a university for $7 an hour. It was worse than the water treatment facility. I had to poke through the layers of sludge with a 14-foot plastic tube. The manholes were by the draining fields, and I could have easily fallen in. Imagine slowly drowning in 10 feet of human waste for a few days where nobody can hear you scream. My dad worked for an engineering company that did a design for a wastewater treatment plant. Once in a while, he'd have to go out to do surveys of the plant. He'd take 10-year-old me along with him on Sundays, when not many people were around. I'd be walking on a metal grate platform, 10 feet over open tanks of liquid crap, and all I could think was, if I jump in, no one's coming to save me. Even to this day, I long for the smell of dental as we disinfect ourselves before getting back into the car. So much fun though. Former environmental engineer. To me, the scariest part of a treatment plant is an aeration tank. Part of modern treatment is nutrient nitrogen phosphorus removal. To do that, you need to cultivate bacteria that will eat the nutrients and then sink to the bottom of a sediment tank. Most of the bacteria that do this need oxygen, and so treatment plants have massive blowers that can inject air into the bottom of a 15-foot pool of poo water. Welcome to the worst way to die. So much air gets diffused into the pool that buoyancy is gone for most people. If you fall in, you go to the bottom and stay there. Part of me imagines the injected air making it take longer for you to drown, though I don't know if it works like that. Story 9. Oklahoma County Jail. I've spent some time in a few other jails for various misadventures, but that place may have well been a prison camp in a third world country. Computers were down for 36 hours, so everyone was crammed into holding cells awaiting processing. There were lice crawling everywhere, and some guy threw his lunch bag in the toilet. Not that I blame him. The green bologna sandwich isn't very appetizing. So it backed up all over the floor. The entire staff looked like the My 600 Pound Life All-Star Team, and you were lucky to get a six ounce styrofoam cup of water once every six hours. Absolutely disgusting, especially when my crime was a six 
six-year-old failure to appear charged with a speeding ticket. Go screw yourself, OKC. Oklahoma is such BS. It's like their entire income is trying to give speeding tickets to people traveling across the country. I've been stopped more than once with others driving, even when going less than five over. Oklahoma City is my least favorite place in the US, and I've been to almost every state. The only runner-up is Memphis, Tennessee. Biggest disappointment ever, as a big music history fan. Nashville and Chattanooga are decent, but Memphis is absolutely amazingly crappy. We stopped in Memphis on a road trip to see the solar eclipse in Nashville a few years back. We figured there had to be something worthwhile to see in Memphis. We got there during the day. Absolute poverty and depression and trash everywhere. One strip of fake-looking touristy honky-tonk bars that were closed because it was too early. Just a crap hole of a place. We did have a great barbecue at some joint, but it was pretty far out of the way of downtown Memphis. We left quickly. Story 10. I live in New Zealand, and to get from my city to the country's biggest city, Auckland, you used to have to drive through a town called Huntley. I don't care how nice the locals might make it seem, it is the ugliest, dirtiest, most feral place I've been in this country. Thankfully, they put in a highway about one to two years ago, so now you can just bypass it. Huntley's not as bad as it used to be. Stopped there for dinner on my way south about five years ago, and they had really tidied up the town center, put in new brickwork, cleaned up the graffiti, etc. Didn't feel as sketchy as it used to be either, like there weren't random groups of guys just standing around drinking and doing nothing. Also went on a tour of the power station once, which was cool, I'd say there are worse towns in North Island, especially in Northland. It's pretty easy to rag on Huntley, it has a deserved reputation, but there are some pretty awful towns in New Zealand that are so bad. The one that comes to mind for me is Ohira, a town that is very out of the way. Their main claim to fame was a very old prison that had been shut down for years. It's so eerie on the streets there, there are endless empty shop fronts, and the people stare at you as you drive through. You feel like a trespasser, and like the people don't want you there. Story 11. Qatar. Crappy slave state with no culture of their own. Essentially all of the Persian Gulf states have huge oil funds which they use to have little to no taxes and a stipend for their small native populations. They make this system work by importing an enormous amount of migrant workers from Asia, Philippines, India, etc. The migrant workers are often treated poorly by the wealthy nationals, they have effectively no legal protections from their employers, and the state can revoke their visa at any point to manage the supply of labor. The reason Qatar is accused of being a slave state is because some employers, such as many of the construction companies that worked on the World Cup stadium, would seize their workers' passports when they started the job. As such, workers cannot leave their job or the country and are effectively trapped by their employer, working in potentially fatal conditions. As an addendum, you don't even have to be a poor migrant to be a victim of this system. Qatar and many other Persian Gulf countries use the kafala system to hire foreign workers. These workers range from uneducated and underpaid construction workers to soccer players and coaches paid millions of dollars every year. To leave these countries, you need to get an exit visa, which needs the approval of your sponsor, your employer. Legally, you're basically a kid who needs approval from their caregiver to travel abroad. This gives tremendous power to your employer because they ultimately control your fate. They could stop paying you at any time, and if you dare take legal action to enforce your rights, they'll basically make you a prisoner with no means to live and no way to escape the country. This happened to a French soccer player, Zahir Balunis, who stopped being paid and refused an exit visa by his club, and ended up being stuck in the country for two years. A similar fate struck a soccer coach who got trapped in Qatar for five years. Story 12 don't get me wrong, I love Hanoi and most of Vietnam, but in the old quarter of Hanoi, the sewage tends to seep up into the gutter due to ancient broken pipes. When a waft hits you in 30 plus Celsius heat and high humidity, I'm not sure there's much worse than that. I would take the old quarter of Hanoi over almost any part of Phnom Penh any day. I don't know if it was because I was a solo woman staying in a horrible hostel, but there was something about the whole place that really skewed me out. I traveled to multiple cities and small towns in Cambodia and Vietnam on my own. That was the only place where I felt genuinely unsafe. 
I don't remember PP smelling horrible, but there was definitely a fish market at some place in Vietnam where I'm 90% sure I saw a fox or dog roasting on a spit. That was definitely the worst smelling place I have ever been in my life. I'm a Hanoi born and raised and lived near the Old Quarter throughout my childhood, the other side of the lake. The Old Quarter is the worst during the summer, but wait till you get inside the alleys where people actually live. Shared bathrooms, many of them squat toilets with a bad flushing system, multiple multi-generational families live in tight, close spaces with no privacy. It's literally one of the reasons I broke up with a guy. I gagged every time I came to his house and dreaded meeting his family. However, if you go in late autumn, you will be fine. It's such a vibrant area with so much life. Hanoi has been expanding at an exponential rate, but many people still choose to go to the area squeezing in tight restaurants, sitting next to open sewage and traffic, for the food. It's that good. I haven't been home for two years and I miss my home more and more every day. Story 13. Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, 1985. I think my mom and aunt went to buy cheap liquor. Great idea, take three kids under five to what seemed like a war zone for booze. Ah, the 80s. I went there on a missions trip once and for some reason we ended up at the bus station. Five seconds after I sat down on a bench outside, a man with a baseball in his hand came up to me and my friend. He'd show us who the mother effers were near the bus station and then proceed to throw his baseball at them. He'd miss every time walk all the way over, pick it up, and then do the shtick again. For a teenage boy in Laredo, this was peak entertainment. I grew up there in the 80s. Well, in Laredo mostly, but we went back and forth. I remember going to lunch in Mexico when I was a freshman in high school in Laredo before the afternoon classes. Cheap, yummy food. I've moved around a lot in my life since then, but that's the place I've seen the most dead bodies. It felt like the edge of the world that no one looked at directly. Dirty, smelly, awful roads on the Mexican side. There were friends that lived in the little shanty town nearby. Shacks, no insulation. Just scraps forced to stand there and pretend to be a house. People stole electricity. I felt rich because my parents had a washing machine and a car. The really rich people had grass and real trees. The rest of us had short, mesquite trees and little plants in tins. Every day I dreamt of running away. Lots of small-minded people there. So much poverty and superstition. I went back a few years ago and it had grown quite a bit. Less apocalyptic looking now. The only good things there I'd go back for are the rocks and the birds. My dad grew up in McAllen, and we used to go across to Reynosa and down to Nuevo Progreso all the time, with our grandparents in the 80s and 90s. It was awesome. There were great fruit stands, open bazaars, amazing restaurants, and so many people just walking around with no hint of violence. Now, not so much. The last time we went, when we were down there for my grandpa's funeral, it was almost deserted. There used to be a restaurant up on the top floor of the tallest building in Reynosa that was always great, and you could see out across the Rio Grande Valley for miles, and it was just abandoned. Fortunately, Arturo's in Nueva Progreso was still there, but they had an armed guard at the door. It was weird and incredibly depressing. Story 14 my dad wanted to visit Death Valley in July just to see how hot it was once. It was horrible. Fun story, my dad and I once saved some bikers from dying in the heat of Death Valley on the 4th of July. Two couples, one couple on each motorcycle. They had come down from Northern California on a whim and hadn't done any research or gotten adequate supplies. They thought every spot on the map that had a name would have at least a little store. Most of those places are ghost towns or points of interest, not towns or even settlements. It was at least 117. Hot for me, and I grew up where it routinely gets to 107. One of the women had passed out from the heat and the man waved us down. We loaded her in our car and started driving to the nearest hospital, over an hour away. She survived, but my god, people need to respect the desert's ability to kill you. The Death Valley Germans had the same idea in 1996, with the added genius of attempting to go off roaming in a Plymouth Voyager. None were ever seen again, and it took 13 years to find any bones. Something Something about the desert eats some people's common sense. People massively underestimate how important drinking water is and how much you need. I lived in Phoenix and this past summer I did a hike during the day. Not a super hot day but about 100 to 105 and it was only about 7 miles. Normally I'd be fine with my 2.5 liters camelback for a hike like that but for this one I packed an extra 2.5 liters worth of water bottles in my backpack. I drank all of it by about 6 miles in. I did not stop for a piss the entire time. My clothes were barely 
really damp and only in covered places like under my backpack, and by the end I had a minor headache as dehydration was starting to kick in. Nothing dangerous, just started to see some signs. It's super easy to forget how much water your body is burning through when it's just instantly evaporating and injury is something that's easy to forget about if you grew up somewhere where it never breaks 100. Story 15. Fresno, California was pretty crappy when I was there in the early 2000s. I'd swear half of the businesses in what I think was the downtown area were bail bond places. Coffee shop, bail bonds, yarn store, bail bonds, record shop, bail bonds. There we go to our hometown. Hell no, California. I knew you'd be here. I'm sitting in a Denny's in Fresno right now having a salad. It's just after midnight now, and this is about the only place one can find a salad at this hour. Don't judge me. But yeah, Fresno is busted AF. I've lived here for over 40 years, the stories I could tell. Instead of going for the most Fresno story, I'll just give you one from a couple of weeks ago. I was standing out in front of the county jail downtown waiting for my brother to be released when all of a sudden I was surrounded by sheriffs with guns drawn on me. Literally eight sheriffs. Their cars blocking the intersection. They're taking cover behind their doors, aiming their guns at me. Now you might wonder what I was doing. I was sitting on the steps hitting my vape. Nothing too criminal. Apparently a homeless man with a mental illness and a cell phone called 911 and gave them my description. He added to my description, he's waving a gun around in front of the jail. So there I was in the crosshairs, bullets in the chambers, I could be killed with one simple mistake, right? One sheriff shouts to get down on the ground. Another one yells don't move. Another one yells step to the right. And in my mind I said here it is, this is how I die. I rolled the dice and just chose the step to the right command. Then I got face down on the concrete, hands spread out as they instructed next. Hands behind my back, they dogpiled me, roughed me up and cuffed me. They kept screaming stop resisting, where's the gun? I had no gun, I wasn't resisting. After a lot of frisking and questions, that homeless man walked up and they jumped his ass. Sir, you can't be making calls like that. Get the hell out of here and don't come back, they told him. And that was just a random Thursday night in Fresno. This place blows massive schlong. Thanks for watching until the end. If you have a similar story to these that you would like to share with us, please leave it in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please leave us a like and subscribe. For more videos like this one right now, please stop by our channel. Thanks again and see you next time.